gonna have a quick word about verisimilitude. Verisimilitude is a big word, and I had never heard of it before I started dabbling in RPG design. In a nutshell, if you don't know, verisimilitude is the uh, description of how two different sides of something, two different groups, use the same rules. Uh, they are treated the same. The, they are conceptually the same thing as far as the game mechanics go. Uh, what this generally means is that uh, player characters and non-player characters use the exact same mechanics when they are doing the same thing in the story. Uh, different games have different levels of verisimilitude. D&D &D tends to be very uh, uh, strongly in favor of it. A lot of the games that I play tends to be very not. Uh, you've got, uh, I have a, a number of games where uh, NPCs just don't roll dice. Um, they don't have stats, you know. Um, Blades in the Dark, Powered by the Apocalypse. I bring these games up a lot. Um, there's also games that are a little bit more in the middle. Um, and if I could think of an example, I would tell you one. Uh, let me think of an example. Um because you've got, uh, oh, something like uh, uh, Fabula Ultima is sort of somewhere in the middle, where, like, NPCs definitely don't have all the same rules as player characters, but they do have a lot of the same stats, and so they can interact with each other in kind of similar, but not exactly the same ways. Um, there are benefits to verisimilitude. Uh, there's a certain intuitiveness when an NPC is doing a task and they are going to do the same thing that a player character does, you know, there's a certain, uh, like, once that is established as the way the game works, you can very much say, like, there, there's there's an intuitiveness where, like, the players know how the NPC's mechanics are going to work. Uh, and they can expect that going forward. And that there's a benefit to that. The other benefit, of course, is that you can do have the player characters doing things to each other that normally they would only do to NPCs. Uh, skill checks, attacks, things like that. Uh, and then you know exactly how these things are going to work because they work exactly how they would normally work. Those are some benefits. Uh, there, are, uh, there are benefits to having asymmetrical mechanics, uh, the opposite, uh, where NPCs and PCs are treated very differently by the mechanics, and generally speaking, interactions only go one way as far as uh, the game mechanics. Uh, the benefits there is that you, you really get a sense of narrative focus on the player characters uh, that, you, that could potentially be lost if they are treated exactly like every other character in the story. Um, and so there's, there's a certain sort of narrative benefit. And I would, I would wager, not wait, I would, I would venture to say that basically any kind of RPG that touts itself as a narrative focused RPG probably needs to be asymmetrical. Um, I think it's just really hard to do narrative focus, uh, in, in a, a game mechanic system without having the game mechanics say, here are the protagonists and here's how they interact with the world rather than here's how characters in general interact with other characters in general or with the environment. Um, this is not strictly true. Uh, I, I can think of an example off the top of my head. Uh, actually, uh, Legend of the Five Rings has a, a high level of verisimilitude. NPCs very much act like PCs as far as the game mechanics go. Um, they're somewhat simplified uh, just because of the nature of it. Uh, characters in L5R are very complicated. They're, they have a lot of little parts to them. And so NPCs tend to be very simplified versions. And they are not created with at all the same rules that a player character is. Back in 3rd edition D&D, &D, uh, NPCs, including monsters, technically were built using the same rules as player characters. Only you didn't usually start with a class. You would start with racial hit dice which functioned like a class that just had no features. Um, then in 4th edition, they moved very strongly away from that, where monsters and PCs are going to be... They're going to use the same rules to interact with each other, 
but monsters are not created in at all the same way as a player character. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they're, they're generated using a fully separate approach, like almost an opposite approach. Because uh, player characters, you build from the ground up. You say like, okay, here's my character concept, and then I'm going to, you know, advance and grow and gain these abilities, and that will sort of define what I do. Whereas with monsters, you would define what they do, and then sort of uh, fill in the abilities and the stats according to the monster's level and whatever role that they need to uh, accomplish within the, the game. 5e feels like a cross between the two. Um, I've not done very much like monster building in 5th edition, uh, at least not in like almost a decade. Uh, so I can't really speak to it with a lot of confidence. Um, but I know that, uh, that, that it's more, there's more verisimilitude in monster building than there was in fourth edition. Um, you still have like hit points are based on your constitution score. You still have, you know, your, your AC is still calculated from your deck score, etc. You know, the, and, and those things may be modified from a baseline assumption of tens across the board, that kind of thing. Um, I very much prefer, like on the whole, I very much prefer asymmetrical game design. I want a game where uh, the the mechanics of non-player characters, including monsters and enemies and friendly NPCs, is suited for the role that that character is going to play in the game slash story. Uh, I do not need symmetrical mechanics uh, in order for me to to like grasp what it is that a creature is doing. I very much like the idea that the player characters are narratively special. Now, I know that's not everyone's cup of tea. I know that some people prefer that the, the player characters be treated like any other character in the setting, and that's going to create a sort of sense of realism and immersion. And those are just fully not necessary for me. Like, I, I get no value out of that. What I get value out of is strong storytelling tropes. And one of the tropes that I gravitate towards very uh, immediately is that the protagonists of the story are the protagonists of the story, and we should expect that they hold special narrative significance. Uh, and I like that uh, that there there are systems out there that can really support and encourage that kind of approach to storytelling. Um, is that true in fourth edition? Yes, to an extent. Um, one moment. <coughs> uh -huh. Let me uh, wash down my throat. Mm. Ah, yes. All right. So, to an extent, 4th edition does this. Uh, because the player characters are very powerful, um, they are very effective, they have a tremendous amount of agency with regards to the flow of battle, uh, much more so than monsters typically do, uh, they are able to usually handle any encounter that is of even reasonably appropriate level. There's a kind of a wide bar of encounters that are challenging enough that they have to try, but not so challenging that they're really at significant risk of taking a casualty. Uh, as long as you stay within that bar, they'll be fine and you can reasonably expect that they are going to continue the story. Um, and so the, uh, the, the narrative weight of 4E is usually not found in, like, oh, will we survive this combat encounter? But more like, you know, will we stop the villain in time to foil their plans, you know? Those are the kinds of win-loss uh, uh, objective... Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Those are the kinds of stakes that usually drive narrative tension in 4th edition. Not will we survive. Because there's there's a certain point in 4th edition where, like, you, you just, like, like, you're not going to die. And if you do, it's fine. You come back. Uh, you know, uh, nearly every epic destiny after a certain point was printed with, like, oh, when you die, you just come back for free. Uh, and that's really cool. 
uh, and, and so at that point, like, the, the risk is not to the player characters. The risk is to the world around them. And the question is, can we save the people we want to save? Can we stop the bad guy? And that's how you, you drive up tension in that game. Uh, and there's a lot of... There are a lot of games where uh, uh, the tension doesn't come from, you know, uh, are we going to overcome this equal challenge you know there's there's like we have our group and then we have an enemy group that is the same size and reasonably speaking the same power level uh and we are going to come to blows with them and this is unavoidable uh there's a lot of games where like it's sort of a foregone conclusion that yeah the player characters are going to triumph simply because they have greater tools they have more resources you know the 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 mechanics are very much bent in favor of the player characters surviving, and that's good, you know, uh, because if the player characters die 50% of the time, it's really hard to tell a continuous story when you're swapping out, you're fully swapping out the cast every two or three encounters. Um, and, and that, like, how much that has to do with, like, I started out with verisimilitude, now I'm talking about, you know, balancing combat encounters and creating narrative tension. To bring me back to my original point, uh, uh, verisimilitude has certain advantages when it comes to, like, players learning the mechanics of the system and sort of intuitively understanding how things are supposed to work. But it doesn't provide any narrative benefit uh, as far as, like, you know, having your game mechanics help you tell the kinds of stories that it's supposed to tell. Verisimilitude doesn't help with that at all. In fact, it usually is a hindrance. Uh, there are benefits to doing both ways. Uh, I prefer one way. Maybe you prefer a different way. Uh, in either event, D&D uh, &D tends to be very strongly in the, uh, the the camp of verisimilitude being a thing, quite institutionalized, even at its most asymmetrical in 4th edition. Uh, it, like, monsters still made attack rolls. Uh, they still had all the same defenses as a player character. Uh, they had all the, like, the same core stats is the thing. Um, and so, uh, uh, that's something that, like, I think that was, that was one of the first things that I noticed after I started moving away from, from D&D &D back in 2012, 2013, something like that, is when I started thinking, like, man, I should play other games. Like, D&D's kind of kind of run its course, right? It's kind of old hat. Um, it was one of the first things that I noticed was that most other RPGs don't have this, like, you know, all characters use the same rules. Like, that's not a law across RPGs in general. Uh, I would be hard-pressed to say if it is most commonly done that way or not. Uh, I don't really have a good sense of that. I would... Uh, man, if I had to guess, I would say most RPGs don't have full verisimilitude like D&D &D does. Uh, at least not amongst RPGs that are not directly based on D&D. &D. Um, yeah, so uh, those are my thoughts on verisimilitude. I had, I, it came up in a previous video and I thought, let's make a video on that. I haven't talked about that in a while. All right? So, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts.